Welcome back to the Pilgrim Faith Podcast, where human wonder fuels the quest for Christian wisdom. I'm joined once again by my faithful co-host, Dr. Joseph Minnick, and today we have the pleasure of speaking with Mark Oliveira and Matt Miller to discuss the power of biography, which is also the topic and title of an upcoming regional convivium hosted by the Davenant Institute on March 26th. Uh, Mark Oliveira holds an MDiv from uh, BJU Seminary and serves as an elder at Trinity Bible Church in Greer, South Carolina, where he also runs a, a successful business, Olivero Design, and he's been an enthusiastic lay theologian for many years and blogs at theologydelish.com. Matt Miller is the director of the C.S. Lewis Institute Greenville. Uh, Matt has previously served as a senior pastor, theological translator, and adjunct seminary professor. He studied economics and philosophy at Wake Forest University before going on to earn an MDiv from Reform, Reform Theological Seminary in Charlotte. Um, he's currently a non-residential PhD candidate at the University of Bristol. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for coming on. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Joe, for having us here. And Our hello pleasure. to you, Matt. Good to be with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So perhaps what we can do um, is we can begin by uh, having Mark talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming regional convivium, which will be at the Davenant House, um, and why the Davenant Institute is interested in talking about this genre of literature, the, the, the genre of biography. And the way that uh, the title is, uh, both for our, our topic of our discussion, but also for the conference, is the power of biography. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But Mark, maybe you can help us to uh, think about what Davenant's doing, why they're moving into the genre, and then we'll really drill down into some of the specifics. Yeah, great idea. Um, just to mention real quickly, the the usually we have this conference in January, but this year because of COVID and the, you know, the, the, the excuse because of COVID is right. becoming, is becoming the widespread reason for why things are changing the way they are. But That's uh, why we think my laundry actually when my <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, Mrs. Stenberg may have something to yeah, say sorry. about that. So. Uh, but in any case, so it's, it's being moved to, uh, March 26th, the 27th. And we're actually very excited about that because that actually may be a really good time of year to have this conference. And so we're going to test those that date or that that last weekend uh, in March and, and see if that works better for us ongoing. Uh, so this interview and thank you to both of you guys for, for mm. doing this to, in anticipation of this event. So to answer your question, uh, Dale, why are we doing this? It probably would be good to just give a real quick overview of, uh, of, of what we tell people, what is the Davenant Institute? And this is something, being on the board of the Davenant Institute, something that we, we wrestle with how to communicate this succinctly and carefully. So I would yes. say that hmm. the Davenant Institute, which is the, that's the umbrella institution over all that we're going to talk about, what is our mission? Our mission is to strengthen fellow travelers in the wisdom of the classical Protestant tradition. Mm -hmm. And there are, so how do we do that? Uh, we do that. There are six outlets or six tools that we, we use to accomplish that mission. Uh, one is the Davenant Hall, the Davenant House, Davenant Press, Davenant Podcast, of which Pilgrim Faith is one of those and the Dag Davenant uh, Language Institute, as well as Davenant Events, which is kind of a catch-all phrase for uh, our favorite term, convivium, uh, or other events. Uh, and so I, I can just say something real quickly about that, and then we can get to why it is that we're doing this literature-focused event. Davenant Hall is uh, where we provide online classes and even a degree program, the MLIT program, which is started, it started last year. And so this is one of those cases where COVID actually has benefited us because mm -hmm. being able to do things online, like, you know, what you gentlemen are doing and, uh, and other things, David has just come on strong and we've mm -hmm. been very well received online with uh, people just auditing classes or in this, or as I mentioned, 
working toward a degree. And then there's Davidet House, which from where, where I live is about 30 minutes north of here. Michael Hughes and his family, his wife, mm -hmm. Lynette, are very uh, involved in a building a network in the community. And that is basically our the Davidet Institute Study Center. So if the mission of Davidet Institute is to strengthen fellow travelers in the wisdom of the classical, tra classical Protestant tradition, then that is the place where we do that by means of Christian discipleship. Mm. Then there's David and Press, and Joe, of course, was a former editor, mm -hmm. uh, did a very excellent job. Ansi Camel is now the editor, mm. and a lot, of, a lot of books. And I have a bunch of them here on my, my shelf, and I, I love the, the stuff that David is uh, Press is putting out. Davenant uh, podcast, Pilgrim Faith, which you guys are doing. And then there's a lot of things that, that show up on an irregular basis over at uh, Common Places. Uh, and, well, and that's also on, um, I think you can catch that on Apple Podcasts as well, can't you? Yes. And, you, and YouTube. So, mm -hmm. And then there's Davenant Language, which is, that's Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, but it's taught from a, a classical Protestant perspective, which is very valuable. And then there's David at Events, uh, Convivia, which, uh, I mean, have been hosted at the Kilns, if can you believe that? Uh, yeah. All the way from there to the West Coast, and then uh, it, and then back at, at David and House, our national event, which uh, we're going to do this summer. And the focus on, for that particular, the theme for that particular event is going to be to focus on education. And I forget the exact title, of it but uh we all look forward to that and hopefully covid won't ruin our our plans on that Indeed. so and gene so Blythe, i think is uh the plenary speaker yeah that's yeah. right yeah that's yes. that's uh that's a pretty heavyweight uh yep name there so, so that just gives you an idea of of davenant the you know the overall focus uh helping fellow fellow travelers gain wisdom in the classical protestant tradition so um you know, do you want to uh, deal with the question of why we're doing this literature? Event? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess maybe how does that fit? With the, the with the power of biography. So maybe what we can do is talk about biography in general, and then we'll um, have uh, Matt talk about how, because one of the interesting things when we begin to talk about biography um, is the way that it's uh, used by individuals. So um, biographies, and this is really apropos because I'm just finishing them at the tail end of the uh, uh, bio that just came out on Bovink, the critical biography on Bovink. Right, yeah. Fabulous, yeah. just fabulous. Yeah. I mean, everybody should be reading this book. Yes. Uh, but, and he's making some corrections about other biographers that have taken up and started to write and talk about Bovink. And one of the things that I'm noticing is if you have a sort of like agenda, and I'm not I'm not imputing nefarious motives on anybody here. I'm just, but biographies could be wielded towards someone's particular end. Somebody could uh, use a, a, a person in, in history that was influential and paint them in such a way as to push something that they want everyone to sort of take a hold of and, and walk away with going, ah, if I want to be like this influential person, here's the things I can don in my own personal life to sort of live out that vision or whatever. Um, and this can be do done for, for good in good ways, but it also can be done in bad ways. So yeah, maybe what we'll do is Mark, if you want to just briefly talk about uh the genre of biography. Uh, and then Matt, if you want to pick up that second part and we can really start to dig into the, the weeds a little bit. Okay. That's good. Very good. Uh, well, I'll say this, I'll make a general statement about the, the convivium, this annual focus on this, it's, it's called the Carolinas regional convivium. And uh, we focus on some aspect of literature. So last year, the title was Literature in the Service of Christian Wisdom. So that's kind of a general overview. But this year, we're honing in on, in March, uh, the end of March, March 26th to 27th, we're honing in on the genre of biography. So you're quite, and the, of course, the title, the full title of the event is The Power of Biography, Learning from Wise Men and Fools. Right. So you can 
you can see, see in the subtitle there, you can learn from a fool sure. just as much as from mm. the wise. So that's, that's that stand that pops right out from our title, the power biography, learning from wise men and fools. Now, why, uh, why do we take up this? Well, as you've already signaled, uh, Dale and Joe, that there are not so good ways of using biography for yourself, or if you're mentoring others, you're teaching others. Um, and, you know, to be frank, this goes all the way from the publisher's desk all the way to what is sitting on your, your nightstand. Um, why do publishers, most publishers publish books? Because they, they, they want to make money. Sure. So the more salacious or the, most, the more wild something can be or prurient, uh, it, you know, they're, they're hoping that their bottom line will increase um but we're we want to entertain the thought that biography should be whatever biography it is what should be used in a way that that fosters wisdom in us and a greater understanding of what it means for the imago day to be shining out through us and um you know, this this idea of looking at other human beings who have su succeeded or failed, uh, this this goes all the way back to, you know, you look at the the philosophers like Seneca, um, Cicero, Aristotle, so forth. They understood that you there wasn't just the abstract idea of right and wrong but you needed to see how it was. And the word that, that you used, Dale, when we talked before was you needed to see an exemplar yeah. of that. So there's, there's your overview. Yeah. And I, I guess, <clears throat> Matt, we, uh, it is interesting. Um, Cause I remember like before Mark actually brought the idea up to do a podcast promoting um, the, the convivium that you gentlemen are going to be presenting papers at, uh, Again, I'm going to talk about the bobbing thing, but I was Joe and I privately in our chat. I'm like, I kept saying to him, what we need now is a bunch of bobbings. Like we need a bunch of bobbings to be like cranking out theology and talking about sociology and talking about politics and helping us understand the modern world. So we all don't just, you know, go crazy with 2020 and 2021 already. Um, so maybe talk a little bit to us about that. Uh, that aspect of biography, the power of biography, and how, as Mark's saying, the Imago Day, we have something to learn as we read about these historical figures, and how that could. What, what's the bad and what's the good from from this genre of literature? Mm. Well, I think um, Jonathan Edwards, you know, continued the tradition of, of of giving a great theologian giving attention to biography when he wrote about the life of David Brainerd and put his, his diary together with mm. notes and annotations. Um, he was certainly commending a kind of self-reflection that Edwards himself practiced. And um, yeah, you have to go back to why did Beza write a biography of Calvin? It was to continue the theological program of Calvin in Geneva and beyond Geneva by um, putting together the biography of the figure who, who, who most encapsulated it. Sure. Um, you know, Athanasius writing on St. Anthony is, is also, I think, very apropos in this discussion. Um, so the, the power of biography clearly is that, um, when, going back to Edwards, when he wrote his thing on David Brainerd, it got read later by Robert Murray Machane. And Machane says, you know, basically he feels like such a, a nothing compared to, to David Brainerd. Yeah. Um, but then he remembers that even Brainerd's was a borrowed light. And the Shane says something to the effect of, you know, I have access still to the same source of that light. And so that's, that's a, a hope for me as I read about someone I consider so much greater. Um, so the, the great power of biography, Christian biography in particular, is that we get to see that, that borrowed ray in mm -hmm. their lives. Um, but like you have already alluded to, there's this danger that the one presenting the biography has another agenda in mind than simply 
capturing and, and presenting this borrowed ray. Yeah. Um, and you know, the, the, the one that comes to mind for me, it's still somewhat recent are the, the dueling biographies on, on Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So, <laughs> uh. Yeah. 2010, we had the one by Eric Metaxas. Right. Um, and that one went well beyond your typical theological readership. And almost every pastor I knew had read, had read that book, and I read it with, with a lot of enjoyment. Um, but it, as, as people kind of immediately suggested, it seems that Metaxas is making, uh, you know, an early, mid 20th century, early 20th century German theologian sound an awful lot like an American evangelical. Yeah. Uh, and then in response, Charles Marsh, the professor of religion at UVA, writes a biography, Strange Glory, on, on Bonhoeffer. And, and Marsh had begun just by researching Bonhoeffer's time in America and, and some of his travels to the American South. And he was going to write a whole book on that. But because Marsh had just written his angle, or because Metaxas had just written his angle on Bonhoeffer, Marsh felt the need then to expand into a comprehensive biography that was going to be corrective. And, um, you know, in Marsh's hands, uh, Bonhoeffer comes across really as, as a, a, a more mainline American Protestant with very kind of leftward leaning mainline views. Hmm. And, and, and Marsh seems, you know, unable to restrain from trying to present Bonhoeffer as someone who struggled with uh, same sex attraction. And so it's just these, 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 these dueling biographies. And then you've got German scholars who read these two biographies and they say Metaxas really kind of skewed Bonhoeffer toward the American right, political right, and he also didn't have any knowledge of original sources. Um, you know, didn't read anything in German. Right. But Marsh, who could read German and could get into all these original sources, has way more errors in his biography of Bonhoeffer than Metaxas did. Mm. And so, um, you know, they number of places where 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 Marsh was essentially um, fabricating facts that had no basis at all. And, and they really took him to task for his characterization of Bonhoeffer's relationship with Eberhard Bethke as being somehow a, a, a homoerotic relationship. Mm. So, you know, in, in the course of four years, you have these two biographies that become the most read biographies among Americans um, about Bonhoeffer. And it would seem the estimation of the very best German Bonhoeffer scholars that one was in the service of the American political right and one was in the service of the American political left. Hmm. Um, and hmm. so it, it really it really does demonstrate the degree to which um, an author can use uh, a life not to focus on the borrowed ray, you know, the borrowed light in that life, but to try and advance an agenda. Um, and particularly as someone who has as interesting of a life and as complicated of life uh, intellectually and politically as Bonhoeffer, you know, unless you're an expert, it's, it's difficult to know who's right. Mm. Um, so, it, yeah, it, it was interesting to me. I remember after the, uh, I entered college in, I think the year, well, I should not say, I think it, it was uh, 2001. It was the fall of 2001. <laughs> and I was taking a government course. And of course, this was fairly, I mean, this was just a year or two after the kind of Clinton Monica Lewinsky scandal where there was a lot, and there was a lot of sort of culture wars, you know, being fought around that totem, sort of like, you know, character matters or doesn't matter. And now those, those voices seem to be flipped, <laughs> you know, in the yeah, other right. direction of these days. But uh, when I was taking this class, it was very interesting to me that uh, it seemed to me that all of a sudden sort of like presidential biography uh, became consumed with the sex lives of presidents. Mm. So it was sort of like, uh, oh, you know, as a way almost of sort of, saying uh, almost sort of modifying people's moral reactions. Let's go back into the past and let's sort of play up and make super significant, you know, how many presidents had affairs and whatever. And there was some question, I just remember thinking like, even if this is true, I wonder what this is doing to the, the kind of narrative thread, if you will, like why it seems like it, it says more about us perhaps yeah. that we're so interested in going back and clarifying these questions and then kind of centralizing them and making them the real story, if you will, uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, uh, not, not anything you avoid, but nevertheless also something that you, um, I don't know, integrate into a whole life, you know, because you are trying to look at a whole life. 
uh, and it's and it's compensatory, of course, in some ways for you know an opposite tendency, which you see in some popular biographies, especially you know a hundred years, especially if we're thinking like biographies written and even sort of whole histories written. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, several decades ago, which had, you know, a tendency to, uh, you know, more hagiographical style and sort of like the goal of this is sort of to evoke emotions in you, you know, so that you'll identify with, you know, I'm, I'm with George Washington or Lincoln or whatever it is. Right. Um, but yeah, but it was, a, it was a curious phenomenon to observe. And it always struck me as kind of imbalanced and actually just not a very good way to look at an actual life. More real biographies are more interesting than that. But doesn't that kind of go to show that. doesn't that go to show the the whole point of the power of biography yeah. the people who are invested in an advancing agenda recognize if we can bring a great biographical figure kind of you know uh, pulling our cart that's going to really help us uh, it's more yes. than just presenting a set of ideas we need compelling lives connected to these ideas for them to have to have mm. purchase in the mm. lives of others yeah yeah, and I and this is just, I mean, on one level, uh, we all do this to a certain extent, right? Like we read that we read a biographical, uh, we read a biography, and then when we get into differences, well, like, we can point back and go, well, such and such did these things in their life, right? And that we sort of like co-op them to help support whatever it is that, and the and the fact is, is life lives are just messy. And so like it, it, like what Joe's saying here, where they sort of take on a tendency of just showing the good. And then with the presidential uh, biographies that came out where it's like, here's the scandal. Um, it does really get down to a marketing thing, but I guess maybe Mark, what do you think is um, the ideal? How should Christians, I guess, number one, approach the purchase of biographies, the use of biographies, and what are some things that your everyday sort of lay person in the pews that really likes this genre of literature should be aware of that they're encountering as they read? Um, some of the tendencies uh, that, you know, people can sort of integrate into their psyche or sort of, you know, uh, adopt as bits of personality that they want to emulate that's that can be good and that can be bad. So, like, give us a, a way, not a method or, or anything like a 10 step. Here's the 10 things you need to do before you read a biography. Uh, but just some of the cautions that you would tell people about reading biographies and some of the things that you'd push people into and say, do these things when you're be conscious about doing this while you're in, encountering biographies. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, when you're you're in an interview like this, there's you're always hoping for the question that's like the the golden yes nugget or the fastball down the middle and yeah, so thank right. thank you for the question and i should mention too we we you know we we talked a few moments ago about our convivium on biography that's coming up in just a few weeks on march 26th and 27th that matt is going to be our uh, our keynote and so yes. we're, we're really yeah. looking forward to that. And hopefully, you know, we can talk about his connections with the C.S. Lewis Institute and uh, and circle it back around, because I, I think he's got an interesting story to tell there. Speaking of, of biography. Mm. So to answer your question, uh, what is what is some just some basic advice um, in picking biographies and then the ones that you do pick using them well? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, I mentioned when we talked earlier about the funnel effect, and I, I think that applies to so many areas of knowledge where you start out with this broad but solid universal principle, and then you work down to the particulars from that universal uh, so that you're – because it's easy. If you just walk into a bookstore, uh, you know, Barnes & Noble, my wife and I were there recently – and she was there looking for a calendar. And all of a sudden it occurred to me, you know, I had, hadn't really planned to come here. So I'm just wandering right. around, around the store looking yeah. for, a, for a deal, uh, you know, asking uh, the help, uh, where's your biography section or, you know, where's your, uh, your, cause I'm looking for other, other editions of Tolkien, whatever, where's your fantasy section, which is typically where, uh, where I find, um, you know, uh, a Tolkien or, or, or Lewis or other related uh, things. Um, but you imagine walking into a, 
to a bookstore and as we mentioned early on having this thought before your handle your hand pulls the handle you say to yourself imago day or imago day however you you pronounce that made in the image of God. You look at, you can see a reflection in the glass made in the image of God. Somebody, you open the door, a lady, a total stranger walks past you and you whisper to yourself, Imago Dei, image of God. So you walk in the bookstore and you are just you're just overwhelmed with the wonderful thought that God has made all of these human beings yeah. that whether it's a memoir or a book of, you know, cause I think broadly speaking, biography covers things like memoirs, journals, which I have, I have here the journals of, uh, of Jim Elliott um, or autobiography or biography or even history where somebody would be writing a history and they'll pull out a chapter that focuses on, uh, you know, maybe it's a uh, history of the Civil War, but there's a chapter on Lee, on Lee or a chapter on Lincoln, just a, just a snapshot. So what I'm looking at, uh, whether it's living human beings walking through the bookstore or lives that are written about, is I'm looking at people who are made in the image of God. I, I think that's a that's a very wise and prudent way to begin to pick out biographies. And then here's a second thought that comes to me is that in you, Joe, Dale, Matt, myself, we have the Imago Day, but it's not a static thing. Right. Sometimes we we talk about that theological logical category as if it's just this static concept. But it's not the Imago Day in the in the four of us and anybody else that's listening or, or not listening. It's not a static thing. It is something that to use to, to use Matt's term, it is light that needs to be. It, it, it's light that needs to be illumined. And so when I'm reading a biography of so and so, then I should ask myself, how can I let the light of the Imago Dei shine better through me by what I learn from these pages. And I'll give you one example and then I'll, I'll punt back to you, uh, you Dale or, or, uh, or Joe, um, my, my hairdresser. And I, you know, if you were, it's okay. I don't see, you don't even, you don't even need a laugh track. Do you? That's right. <laughs> Very good. Uh, yes. I couldn't have asked for better timing there, Dale. Thank you for That's laughing. Right. My hair. I'm serious. I have a hairdresser. Mm. I, I quit going to a barber uh, many years ago because it, for just one reason, because you know, what little hair I have, I would say to the barber, just, you know, can you cut here, cut this? And he would never do what I, what right. I wanted him to do. Right, right. So I went to this, to this lady who, uh, you know, I would ask her to do it and she did, she did what I asked. Anyway, so uh, her name was Betty and Betty has uh, books. You know, you go to a hairdresser, you expect to see magazines. Well, this lady is unusual. She has books stacked. And so one time I walked in there, I said, oh, what's that one? It said the, it was called The Politician. And uh, come to find out, she said, oh, yeah, that's a that's a uh, I guess you could call it a I don't know if it'd be a memoir, but it's kind of in that category of the the, the junkie tell all um, story of John Edwards. You remember him? Mm. You yeah. Know, back uh, running. He tried to run for president and then he, yep. he, you know, was ended up being the VP on the on the ticket. And of course, they ended up ended up losing. But his life, he had he had everything in his favor. He was good looking. People would make fun of his hair, but it was really like a compliment because his hair was so gorgeous. And uh, he had he had charisma and personality, but his personal life was a train wreck. Mm -hmm. And so she said to me, you can borrow the book. Well, anytime somebody says you can borrow a book, you know, keep it as long as you want. I'm <laughs> you look behind me. I'm in for right, that, right, you know. Right, right, right. So I read it and I will tell you, it's not the kind of book if I were walking into Barnes and Noble, like I said before, 
that I would have picked up, but I'm glad I read it because it showed me at the very least what it's like to be given so much opportunity, so much charisma, uh, so much access, Mm. and then to throw it away because of a series of really bad decisions. Um, That's a negative example. We can think of other positive examples, but then you rewind John Edwards life, or at least that's part, that part of his life. And you say, John, what could you have done differently? And what can I do differently? So I don't make those same mistakes. I I think the other thing, just kind of piggybacking on something you said, Mark, that that I find fascinating when I've read biographies and and the one that I'm thinking of most uh, right now is the one, uh, Dale mentioned, uh, I, like him, I just finished this biography of Bavink, which is fantastic. And we'll be, I hope, talking to Eglinton in just a couple, couple weeks here. Um, but in any case, it's treating, uh, treating life itself as a kind of uh, uh, a vector of God's revelation. In other words, it's not, it's, uh, it's not accidental that God has written written uh, uh, kind of the canvas upon which he's understood in the language of a lived life. That is that somebody is born and grows up and gets married and has children and becomes old and dies. That's actually the canvas on which it's painted for for all of us, at least on this side of the veil of tears. Um, And so there's something theologically, and and there's actually philosophers like um, Julian Marius is a, a, a Spanish phenomenologist philosopher who would say, you know, that a life or, or, or that I am I in my circumstances. So, you know, I go read Reform Dogmatics and there's Bovink doing his four volumes. But what the biography offers is why is Bovink emphasizing all of these things? You know, sort of mm. what is his life? What are yeah. his immediate set of concerns? What were his ecclesiastical concerns? What were the right. cultural concerns? And that's what he's just floating around in. And then his intellectual project is a sort of unification of of those concerns into a coherent whole. And when you see that coherent whole, you both either appreciate it more or you see its limitations more. You see like, well, this was driving him. And as it turns out, there's a better solution to that thing, however you want to do that. But nevertheless, biography, it seems to me is a, it's a crucial illuminating point. And you see, you can say the same thing in the Reformation. It's very hard really, you know, to abstractly talk about sort of reformed versus Roman Catholic theology, for instance, without recovering the imaginative circumstance of the 16th century. You have to remember what it was like to be Martin Luther and to look out the window and see the church looking like this, to really make sense out of the Reformation. Um, And Marius actually went on, interestingly, to write a, he wrote both a history of philosophy, this is hard to find, but you can find it, but uh, Marius also wrote a biography of philosophy. Yeah, which yeah, is I noticed kind of that. Interesting, I noticed that. Yeah. Uh, uh, which is sort of like, let me treat the the, the history of the philosophical conversation as though no. it were sort of a life. Here it is; it's its beginning. Here is here it's maturing. Here's its old age, if you will. Uh, you know. So I think the, you refer to that in uh, uh, in the Lord is One in your chapter. Yes. You talk, yeah, you talk about you refer to his. That that's where I first learned because I have his history of. But you mentioned the biography of and the biography. I think that, yeah, and I think that that pairing or contrast is fascinating. And what he's yeah, what he's trying to do there is he's trying to show how uh, uh, he's trying to show how philosophical movements originate in life. In other words, it never was just a purely abstract thing. It was always sur- philosophy was always an urgently felt f- project that we need to do for very concrete circumstantial reasons, uh, uh, which doesn't you know n- you know negate its value, but nevertheless helps you see. Why was it that, you know, these kind of pre-Socratic philosophers began to think this was a good project and he sort of theorizes based on their circumstances, maybe what was the catalyst, you know, to actually start to thinking and putting questions in these particular terms. Uh, But yeah, it's a very, uh, it seems to me that the genre is partially just so useful on the one hand, because we need exemplars. Uh, but on the other, because, well, well, maybe it's this is just saying that very same point in a different way. 
uh, we need exemplars precisely because life itself is finally the thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's actually yeah. the thing we're trying to inform. The rest of it's the scaffolding, but it's life itself, uh, you know, where all of this actually comes together and becomes concrete. And so a biography can, when it's well done, be a great way of uh, helping you kind of integrate those threads in a meaningful, personal way. Yeah. Yeah. Joe, yeah, I think that's that good really well put and as you're describing you know understanding what reformation what the reformation really felt like through the lens of biography it just reminded me of that uh kind of pivotal moment early in luther's life that roland baton captures so well where the young luther is you know, overcome with his sense of sin and guilt and he's using all of the late medieval means at his disposal to try and um assuage it none of it's any good and so uh, you know, his spiritual director Stalpit says, well, go, go to Rome, take a little time, go to Rome and, you know, avail yourself to everything there. And there's that, there's that moment where Bainton describes Luther, you know, going up Pilate's steps and you're supposed to, you know, kiss each one and uh, say a Hail Mary, whatever it is. And he gets to the very top and he just wonders, has this done anything good for me at all? Hmm. Yeah. And, and, and it just hits you, you know, you yeah. kind of realize, okay, yeah. it's not yeah. abstract. Um, late medieval piety versus uh, a doctrine of justification. Yeah. Uh, and what, he's looking what, what across the like. street. He's looking across the street and seeing like, there's the priests going into the brothel. And yes. this is just normal. Yeah. 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 yeah stunning. Well, we, we, you did mention the CS Lewis foundation and as a personal thing, do you know, Andrew Lazo, Matt? I don't. And um, is he with the C.S. Lewis Foundation or the C.S. Lewis Institute? He might be with the Institute. He's I don't know. The Institute. Yeah. Okay. All right. Him, but oh, I'm going to have to hook you up with him. You'll love this guy. He's Great. he's a gem. Uh, we've had him on here to talk about, uh, I think he talked, uh, uh, Till We Have Faces. Mm, my favorite. Yeah. Um, yeah. So are you guys doing anything at the C.S. Lewis Foundation? Institute. Uh, Institute. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, are you doing anything in the, the biographical sort of uh, department right now? Is there any projects in the works or mm. what's going on there? In one sense, no. Um, you know, we're not, we're not big into publishing. The C.S. Lewis Institute is, is more of a discipleship ministry as opposed mm. to the C.S. Lewis Foundation, which is much more about putting publishing out C.S. Lewis okay. resources. But in another sense, that's exactly what we're, we're all about. It's, I feel like Mark, what Mark just said, you just threw me this fastball down the middle without realizing it. Um, I'm good at that. <laughs> so the, the, the C.S. Lewis Institute was founded in 1976 in D.C. Um, and one of the founders was James Houston, still uh, you know, in his 90s now, who was a, a younger friend of Lewis back in the day. Hmm. And his kind of desire in founding the C.S. Lewis Institute, he, he put it in his words, he says the goal of the C.S. Lewis Institute is not to make more fans of C.S. Lewis, but to make 10,000 more like him. Mm. Mm. And, and what was behind that was the recognition that when you look at Christian biography, and even, even if you narrow down to just Protestant Christian biography, it's overwhelmingly missionaries, ministers, and theologians yeah. that get their lives written about. Um, so there's, there's not a lot of, um, you know, heroes, spiritual heroes who were laymen. Yeah. Mm. And, and we oftentimes think of Lewis kind of firstly as a Christian intellectual slash theologian, but he was a tutor at Oxford before his conversion. And he remained a tutor at Oxford after his conversion. Mm. He never changed his job until, you know, he later got the position at Cambridge, but um, he took the lay life that he had before his conversion and offered it to Christ you know, afterwards. And so he's kind of the, the, the patron saint of the layman in, in some ways. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. So that we exist um, through you know, various resources that we offer, but particularly through our fellows program to uh, help adults ages 24 up to literally in their eighties, take the life they already have and, and seek to integrate it in a wholehearted way in, in their personal and public lives to offer mm. it to Christ. Mm. So our one year, Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to no, say, no, may, may your tribe increase, brother. Yeah, You're that's doing fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, this to Definitely. me is an interesting thing about, I, I mean, you know, I've been thinking about this before I came into the C.S. Lewis Institute even, but, um, you know, five years ago when I was a pastor, I was granted a, a sabbatical. And one of the things I did during my sabbatical was try and dig up, um, you know, notable biographies of people 
uh, who were not missionaries, ministers, or theologians, because I was, I was noticing in my preaching and in the preaching of other pastors that literally 90% or more of the time, a pastor was going to make a, a biographical illustration in his sermon. It was from a, a minister, a missionary, a theologian, or at least maybe a hymn writer. Yeah. And, and you begin to subtly get the sense that, hey, um, it, it's not overt, but it's implicit. The messaging is, if you want to live a, a Christian life that's worth commending, you need to become one of these things, which mm. only 1% of the you know, Christian body becomes. Right. Um, so I found it was, it's, there's not a lot yeah. of, of, of things out there. Um, you have to kind of be like a Christian athlete uh, to get a yeah. biography written about you. Yeah. So yeah, there's some young person, oh, go ahead, Joe. Oh, no, go ahead. You finish. If, if there's some young person out there who has a talent for writing and, and storytelling, I, I think there's a, a huge need uh, mm. to be able to develop a, 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 a corpus of biographical literature that, that reflects our theological conviction that all vocations are sacred. Yeah. Um, you know, what Charles Taylor said was kind of this, this great impetus of reform the reformation into the modern world which was the affirmation of the ordinary life yeah, yeah. and you wouldn't you wouldn't get from shelves of reformed or protestant biographies classical protestant biographies the sense that we really do affirm the ordinary life yeah right um, yeah right. so i'd love to see that grow and so lewis is kind of one of our few people who who kept his quote unquote ordinary life offered it to the lord and so what we seek is to um through our one-year fellows program where people, they have a job already. They kind of have it. They kind of know what their career is, know what their calling is. They have their church. They love their, their Bible and they're not looking to change any of those things. They're just looking, how can I take this and integrate it and yeah. be one and the same believer in Christ in all of my spheres of life and offer it intentionally to him. So that's, that's what we, we seek to do in our institute yeah. uh, fellows program. Well, well, I'm glad you spoke first because actually what I was about to say was uh, what you're talking about reminds me of Taylor's affirmation of the ordinary life <laughs> because that, that's exactly, that's exactly this point is, uh, um, you know, I recall, and, and maybe this is in part uh, some kind of sort of big, maybe not big, but, but sort of broad evangelical influences that we all uh, uh, maybe everybody, but Mar uh, uh, Oliveira, who's a little more of a boomer than the rest of us, uh, <laughs> just, but, uh, uh, just a but, little bit. <laughs> yeah, but maybe uh, maybe you had this as well. But I don't know if you uh, grew up in the church, Matt. But you sort of like uh, Dale. You probably remember like sort of flannel graphs and Sunday school and all the yeah. stories at Sunday school would be that missionary or it would be that pastor and sort of like from a very young age, you get this, maybe there's some founding fathers sprinkled in, you know, you know, for yeah. good measure, but yeah. you know, you, you get this uh, kind of hagiographical account of sort of a, a bunch of heroes who went and like, you know, got eaten by cannibals or something. And then, you know, converted the tribe to G, which is all great. Don't get yeah. me wrong, but yeah, you you don't, it, or as you said, that other side is sort of the athlete, the sort of Christian celebrity is the other, is the other kind of genre you get. But you, yeah, that's an interesting point that you don't see, you don't see that life of the person who just served their local community. Yeah. Uh, and, and there might be, you know, there's some reasons for that, that, you know, we don't want to overly judge because of course it's hard for that person to become famous enough that anybody reads about them. Uh, nevertheless, it seems like there's, uh, there's still interesting lives out there that, yeah, don't hit any of those particular, uh, the, uh, go ahead, Dale. Yeah. And I think everybody's life is interesting. I mean, yeah. that's just, we should just say that. And I think when yeah. we're talking about the power of biography, I actually use this um, in discipling my son. Um, my, I have a 13 year old and I'm just figuring out how to deal with a teenager. I'm like, okay, what's going <laughs> on? How do I do this? You know, when you, when you figure that out, you're gonna write the book for us. Yeah, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, the, what, the, the other book that we need in a top to the uh, oh, right. on the, all the other ones. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I try to I try to the way that I try to um, cast a vision for him is like is as like looking at your life like it's going to be read one day as a biography, like because he's reading a lot of biographies right now. And I tell him, I'm like, son, your story, your, your God is writing the story of Dale Stenberg. My son's name is Dale. There's lack of imagination more than pride. I promise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you, you know, God is writing the story of Dale Stenberg right this very second. 
And what is it going to look like when people pick up your book? Not that you're going to have a book written about you, but if you did, what will you look like? What will the character, how, how will it be shaped? How will your community think about you? How will you be remembered in history? And if we're just talking about like the power of biography, that's something that at least me, at least in my own life, as you read, you're reading about a person with flaws and you're reading about a person that had joys and, and excitements and deep depression and, uh, you know, uh, problems they had to overcome and um, vices that they were tempted to sort of fall into. And, and so just viewing your own life in the context of a biographical uh, story that God is actually penning on your be you know, through you, as jo Joe said earlier, sort of like the canvas of reality through which God is communicating. This ties in nicely with what Mark was saying with the image of God and the wisdom yeah. that comes through uh, image bearers. I just, I think it's a, it's, a, it should, it just at least be noted that this can, that angle of biography and that power can really be used by us just in practical ways. So it's not this abstract, you know, we're not just talking about all the abstract functions of biography and the technical, but like as a person, this can help us in, in, in our Christian pilgrimage uh, to the celestial city. But I also think um, it, it also communicates the wisdom of God. Uh, if creation is the means through which God is telling us about him, one of the means through which God is telling us about himself, then surely the pinnacle of creation, which is man, is the clearest indication about God's wisdom. And so I wonder uh, if maybe Mark or Matt or one of you guys could talk about biography's ability to communicate wisdom and how we can sort of have our antennas up to grab a hold of the wisdom that comes to us when we read biographies. Well, I'm, I know I'm, I know that Matt has a lot to say about what you just said. Uh, I'm looking forward to his, his keynote coming up at our convivium. Um, but I'll just throw in a couple things and, and then you guys can be interested to hear what you guys think. Uh, you know, Dale, I, I think your, uh, your illustration or just reminder that you're a dad and Joe too, uh, and Matt, <laughs> we're all dads that uh, I have a son, um, and I think about this too. Um, how can I communicate something that my son needs to know, but communicate it in a memorable way? Yeah. Um, you I just could, hit him. You know, yeah, well, Smack yeah, that, that might, that <laughs> would make an impression, but yeah. uh, not, the, not the kind that I'm going for. Right, right, right. Uh, but you know what? I, I go back to my own, because I, I read a lot of biographies when I was uh, that age as well, and even earlier than that. And partly because I, I lived in Ecuador, South America, and my parents were missionaries. And that was all that was on the shelf. You know, my, my dad was a doctor and so he had his medical books and I was not interested in, the, in those, um, but they had brought uh, books uh, from the U S to the mission field. And that's was, and I, some of those books I read over and over and over again. But what I found is that there were these little vignettes from somebody's life that stood out, you know, it's like a, like a dimmer switch. You turn the light, you know, there's, mm. The light is illuminating through this person's life. And then there's this incident that happens and the spotlight just shoots up. Yeah. And this incident in their life is like, a, you know, it's like a perfect illustration of something. So let me let me just beyond those biographies that I read as a boy. Here, here's a couple things. If somebody asks me, well, let's say my son, if my son asked me, Dad, what's a good can you explain to me freedom? Well, I could, you know, we could, op we could Google, of course, it, we're in the modern era. I'm, sure. I'm a, I'm a boomer, but I, but I do use Google. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but the, one of the first illustrations that comes to my mind is from, I guess you could call it a memoir, but it's, it's autobiography. It's not all of his life. It's a part of his life. Natan Sharansky who was a resistance Jew living in the Soviet Union. Now he's 
He's in Israel, which which was his desire to get there eventually. But this is under this is when the Iron Curtain was, you know, was as steely and iron as it, it ever was. And he was because he was resistant. He ended up in prison and under the KJB, uh, under their, you know, their cruel whatever for a long time. And and so. um he gives this illustration. It's a true story. He was in one of their awful prisons and he tells a Lenin joke to the guard. Okay. And I forget what the joke was, but it's funny. Right. And he, and, and not Taron Sharansky knows it. And when he's telling the joke to the guard, he's saying to himself, he says this in his, in a, in his biography, he says, I, I, in fact, he says it to the guard. He says, I know that you know this is funny, but you can't laugh, and I can. <laughs> and furthermore, uh, you could say, I'm going to throw you in prison, but here I am. Mm. I'm in prison already. And you could put me in solitary confinement, but that's where I just came from, and I'll go back, even for the punishment of a joke. And, and I think Natan even says it. In, in there, he says, this is freedom. I'm hmm. in prison, but I can tell a joke to a Soviet guard who can't laugh, who can't repeat it to somebody else without the risk of losing his job, who can't, he might go home and tell his wife, but you know, you don't want that to get around. Right. So there, so that's a little vignette. So to answer your question, it, I think, you know, maybe a biography, a 600 page or 400 page biography is a lot to swallow but if you know you can read these things these stories of somebody's life and these little vignettes and then at a teachable moment you can pull it out and say this goes with freedom and i'll yeah. give you one more um and it's very pertinent in light of uh, of inauguration day coming up soon uh george the third when he had lost the Revolutionary War, um, was he had a conversation with an American painter, famous American painter, Benjamin West. And somehow they were in conversation together in England and West was there. He, well, West actually did a lot of work for, uh, for the royal family. And West, uh, well, excuse me, uh, King George III said to West, so what do you think uh, Washington is going to do now that the war is over? Will he give his, um, oh no, so West replies and says he's going to go back to farming and he's going to give, give up the, his authority over the army. And mm -hmm. this is what George says. George, King George says, if he does that, if Washington does that, goes back to farming, and gives up his power, his absolute power over the army, he will be the greatest man on earth. Hmm. Well, it's a variety of virtues, heroic virtues, that you can attach to an illustration like that. Sure. And here we are, every four years, we're making this change, probably because Washington was a very wise and prudent man and knew that when he had power in his grasp, the best thing to do was just let it go. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's uh, Lord of the Rings, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like letting go of that power. It's very difficult. So yeah, Matt, if, if this is sort of like the, an angle that you're taking and we're, we don't want to give any, you can give sneak peeks. Mm -hmm. uh, just don't <laughs> give it all away. Uh, but the function of biography to communicate wisdom. Um, and then maybe what we'll do is this will be sort of as we're wrapping up here. And then I'll let Joe ask the closing question because I'm so horrible. Like, I'm just going to ask you, what's your favorite biography? Uh, but we'll, we'll let Joe finish up. But yeah, do talk, talk to us a little bit, Matt, about uh, the function of wisdom to communicate or the function of biography to communicate wisdom. Um, well, the... the little sneak peek of where I'm going to be going with it is uh, I've been impressed by the writings of Linda Zagzespi on hmm. 
moral exemplarism. Uh, she's a philosopher at the University of Oklahoma. She's an ethicist. Um, and she's kind of putting forward a, an ethical theory that's not meant to be a substitute for other ethical theories, but uh, kind of another map of, of ethics that complements all the others. And, and going back to what we said at the beginning, it just, it just hinges on the fact that it's, it's through exemplars that we actually make changes in our behavior, not just through encounters with abstract yeah. theories. And yeah. so that, that leads her to ask, what are the different kinds of, of, of exemplars? And she makes the case that there are three basic exemplars. Um, the hero, um, that could be, you know, uh, an Alexander the Great or a, a, a Shackleton, um, the, the sage and the saint. Um, I have not yet read Eglinton's biography on Bob Inc. I've read some of Eglinton's other works on Bob Inc. and have seen how he, you know, puts to rest the, the two Bob Inc.'s theory and that kind of right. thing. I'm guessing he does that in the biography. But, uh, you know, what, what strikes me about Bob Inc. is, is really his, his, his sageness. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, being faithful to the classical Protestant reform tradition in a post Kantian era and, and, and post Nietzsche, right. Nietzsche. And that's, but um, yeah, so, so kind of asking yourself um, first, am I, am I wanting, as I'm walking into the bookstore and I'm looking at where my own soul is, do I need a dose of the hero? Do I need a dose of the sage? Mm. A dose of the saint? Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm reading, I'm late coming to it, but endurance about Shackleton, uh, because I kind of feel like, are you really, that's, I started that about three weeks ago. <laughs> oh yeah. I started a week ago. Um, yeah, cool. <laughs> we should, we should meet sometime, Mark. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe how about March the 26th yeah, through the 27th? Right. There we go. <laughs> Up at the Davenant house in Landrum. So, <laughs> yeah, there you go. um, <laughs> you know, you read a book like that and it really does inject in you a, a, a readiness to, to, to press on and continue in the face of hardships as, as you're reading about this life that has done this. Um, and then the second distinction that Zach Zespi makes is with, with heroes and saints and sages that there's two kinds of excellence that we see in them. Um, one is natural excellence. You know, Mozart mm. was born to be able to write these things in his sleep right. versus, versus acquired excellence. And, and she's, she makes the argument, it's really the acquired excellence that makes someone a, an exemplar. So I won't go into that now. But uh, I think this, this grid is really helpful for, for asking ourselves at the end of the day, what kind of biography am I reading? And, and what is it really doing to me? What, what juice can I squeeze from it? Mm. Uh, why, why would I read this biography as opposed to another one? Or if I read a, a, a biography on a you know, after I've read Bob Inc.'s biography and it, it brought something alive in me that made me really want to um, take my theology into all spheres of life. Well, what, what should be the next one I read then? Right. Uh, so yeah. that's, that's where we're going to go is, is using some of her grid. Um, and then lastly, in 20 seconds or less, um, going back to the way that McShane, McShane put it, uh, that in great biographies, we encounter a, a borrowed light. I do think as Christians, we need to make sure that we, we seek to trace these biographies back to Christ himself. You know, Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians uh, 3, 18, mm -hmm. beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed, you know, from one yeah. degree of glory unto another. And so, you know, what, um, what in this, what of Christ am I seeing in this life, encountering in this life and, and looking at his triple office, his, his prophetic, his, his mm -hmm. priestly, his kingly aspects of his, his one office as the Christ. Um, mm. Just making sure that as Christians, we do you know, uh, trace the trace the borrowed light back to the original source. Yeah, um, I think it's uh, a task for us. Maybe as a sort of final comment, uh, rather than a question. Uh, uh, but it, it seems to me that's a, that's also a way of reading sort of exemplars in the Old Testament, except in the other direction. It's sort of like they're pointing to Christ. And one of the real interesting structures in the Old Testament is that you seem to if you're kind of reading the narrative from the get-go and you're sort of in the middle of the story and it's sort of, we're waiting for the seed of the woman to arrive, right? Every time you arrive at somebody, the question is, is, is it now? You know, is it now, is it now? Oh, Abraham's here, is he the one? Moses is here, is he the one? And then of course, David. And finally the climax, at least in the historical books is Solomon, it's David's son. You know, and uh, the the way the narrator uh, in I uh, uh, I'm trying to remember here. I think it's second. Is it First Kings? I think it must be First Kings or Second Kings. One of the kings. Uh, but the way the narrator sets it up is uh, 
all of the promises of Abraham, all that God described to Abraham in Genesis is portrayed in very explicit language in, in the, in the Kings as fulfilled. And it's immediately after that, that you see Solomon do all of the kind of misdeeds that we famously associate with his name. And it's as though that what the narrator is trying to do is sort of like get you built up to the, the hero has arrived to, Oh, actually, no, this guy is, has a feet of clay. He's just like the rest of us. The hero hasn't arrived yet. Uh, right. And there's this dual structure then that there's, there's plenty to take out of Old Testament characters as exemplars and the New Testament can speak of them that way. Uh, and yet they're also all quite flawed persons. And the text seems almost against kind of ancient Near Eastern conventional history writing. It seems to show all the dirt, <laughs> yeah. you know, with our people uh, and it's really only when you get to the Gospels that you get the, you know, and it's now we see this as a kind of Greco-Roman biography of sorts, you know, the, the genre that, that Craig Keener has sort of argued there, that there's some biographical element to the Gospels. Here you get the one who's the prophet, the priest, and the king, or maybe the sage, the, uh, what was the the other way of putting that? The hero thing? and the saint. Yeah. The hero, the sage, and the saint all in one person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, yeah, 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 I think that's right. Well, uh, uh, any other thoughts before I take us out, fellas? No, I look forward to the conference and we will actually put a link, I think, uh, Joe. Uh, yeah. I will send that to you. Just throw that in the YouTube. We'll put a yep. link for registration and we'll put a link um, uh, to the work that you're doing, Matt, uh, because what, I mean, just we could actually do an another episode on just what you said there at the end. That's <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think we're good to go, brother. All right. Very well, good. Dale and Joe, thank you very much for taking time to do this. Uh, we enjoy listening to your podcast, and it's been fun to be a part of this conversation. And uh, uh, just for those who are interested in coming uh, to the conference, it's at Davenant House, which is near Greenville, South Carolina, uh, in Landrum, South Carolina. And if you go to davenanthouse.org, you'll get on the just right at the bottom of the home page you'll get plenty of information there there's a link there where you can get information or you can register for this co this convivium that's coming up on uh the end of march so uh thanks again we greatly appreciate yeah. it we pray for you guys we pray for your success and god to bless you thank well, you brother thank you we really appreciate it yes well, you can, uh, you can find us on Facebook if you want to find us there. We have a, a YouTube channel, and on SoundCloud, most of your podcast hosts, you'll find our Pilgrim Faith podcast. But uh, that's all for today. Dale, I love you, brother. Love you, too. Uh, and we'll see you all again next time.